Good morning, Energy Express friends. Ah, our last day of Energy Express for 2020. Well, there's no reason to be sad. We've had a lot of fun. And speaking of fun, we have a whole day of fun in store for you. Let's head over to Sheldon and go fishing! Hello everyone, I am Sheldon Owen, Extension Wildlife Specialist here at Chestnut Ridge Park and, and Campground in Brewston Mills, West Virginia. Today I'm joined by Jason Philhart and his son Hayden and also my daughter Alden and we are going fishing. Jason is the STEM Program Coordinator with West Virginia University Extension Service and also an avid fisherman and angler and we have two young anglers with us today who are really excited to get out and wet a hook. Jason, you've got a lot of equipment spread out here on the table. Walk us through a little bit of this and tell us what we, you'll be using today. All right, so for fly fishing, first thing we have is our fly rod. And fly rods go by length and weight. So this is what is considered an 8.6. So it's 8 feet 6 inches long. And the weight is a 5 weight. So here's our, our line right here. So they generally color the line, and some lines are actually uh, have different colors on one single line to let you know how far out you are. Uh, this reel will actually just clip on the bottom here, and then you pull it out and you string your line through. And then you put on the end of this line, you put on clear line, which is called tippet. So some of the other equipment that we need uh, is a pair of waders. So that's for whenever it's colder out, uh, you know, you want to have a pair of waders on to protect your legs, protect your feet. Uh, these waders just have what's called a boot sock, so you need waiter boots. And then if you're going to uh, keep fish or store some extra gear, there's also a boot here. And then a lot of fishermen, instead of having just a little tackle box, they'll have a fishing vest. And this is actually called a chest pack and this is more geared towards fly fishing because you can fit your big fly boxes right in the packs here. One, three. One, two, three. Okay, so whenever we go fly fishing, we have to have an assortment of flies. So the purpose of fly fishing is to imitate, to use lures or flies that imitate natural bugs. So. Some of the uh, natural bugs that we like to imitate are in different phases of a bug's life cycle, right? So right here, this will be this will be called a nymph. So that would be whenever they say you're nymph fishing, that right there is a nymph, and that's a little caddis nymph. And then we have a dry fly here, which this is a mayfly. This is a light cahill, and then. We also imitate, try and imitate some of the things in the na other bugs in the natural world, like crickets, right here. Okay, so this is uh, a lure like a frog, a fly like frog, and then this is a woolly bugger. And what this is supposed to imitate is a uh, minnow going through the water. All right, so we're, we're getting a fly rod set up here to try. Jason's going to teach me how to use one today. I hope or he's going to try. This is teaching an old dog new tricks. But I've got a fly rod. It's similar to his, not as not as good, a little less expensive, which is which is great for us trying to go out and, and purchase some of this equipment for us to go out and, and fish. This one came pre-spooled, so it's like he was talking about earlier. This is an eight foot six inch rod, five weight. So we have some five weight fly fishing line on it. And if you come down the line, you can see now where we've tied on that leader. So we have the fishing line a knot here keeping these two together, tying these two together, which the fishing li fly line goes into our leader. As you come down, you'll see another knot where we've tied on a tippet. And so this is a little bit finer line, so you go from relatively you know, thicker line to a little bit less thick to, to even a, a thinner line here as we go out to the tip. And this is even tapered to go down to it's a little bit smaller. So this kind of disappears in the water, but if you have a a fly or a popping bug tie down here to the tip, this will kind of disappear in the water and you really don't see it. Also gives you the opportunity, instead of using, you know, using up your leader or trying to retie onto your leader, it gives you a little extra line down here so when we break lines or we retie lines, um, we can 
we can replace that tippet a lot easier than, than the leader of the fishing line itself. All right, one important thing to know when you're out fishing or, or another skill that you need to learn is how to tie different knots. When we talked about our fly line, we had a leader line that was tied to our fly line and then a tippet which was tied to our leader line so there were two different knots right there we also need to tie a fly or maybe a popping bug to the end of our leader line or a tippet so we need to know different types of knots so we can connect those lines together even if you're using a bait caster with one single line and you're trying to tie a, a hook or a lure onto that line you need to know some type of knot that's going to keep that lure attached to the end of your line so I'm going to let Alden here, we're going to use a, a bit of paracord just to maybe better demonstrate because the, the camera can focus on this line a little bit better. I'm going to pretend that Alden is a lure and I'm going to tie her onto the end of my line. So imagine that this is the eye of that lure, the eyelet. We're going to run our fishing line through that eyelet so then it would be connected to our line. This is just a, a simple cinch knot. So if you take that line wrap it around so we've run it through the eyelet we've wrapped it around the line is coming out we're going to wrap it around maybe five or six times we're then going to run it back through the loop and around and create this cinch knot <laughs> caught her she's not going anywhere so we've created that cinch knot now, so that lure is not going anywhere. And I can back it off. <laughs> Look at that face. She didn't really like that. So I can back it off, but you can see there that cinch knot is attaching that lure to the end of the line. All right, everyone, you know, maybe this is some homework for you this summer to go out in your backyard and practice with not only a bait caster, but maybe a fly rod if you had it. These can be very expensive or inexpensive. I know I've seen some at some local retailers for around $30, $40. You can get you a kit just like this. Um, so it's, it's still some money involved, but you can really spend some money if you want to. But, but inexpensively, you can get in, into and get the equipment you need to, to do some fly fishing. Yeah, the important thing about fly fishing is whenever you're just starting, one, it's good to have a mentor. Mm -hmm. So if you can find somebody in your area that's willing to go out with you, uh, you know, give you some pointers and tips, show you where to go, um, but it's good at first to keep it simple. So yeah. whenever you're starting, fly, starting to fly fish, you don't have to go out and spend thousands of dollars on a rod and equipment and everything like that. Like you said, you can go to your local, uh, you, you know, your local bait shop, your local Walmart. Um, you can go online and get you know, a simple rod and reel, something for 30, 40, 50 bucks. Um, it's also important that when you're starting to fly fish that you, that you keep what you're using simple as well. So when you're starting out, maybe, uh, you know, do some research and, and start out with say five to ten flies. You don't have to get uh, make it overly complicated. Um, you know, some fly fishermen only use ten flies, and that's all the you know that's ten types of flies. That's all they'll put in their box because they think and they feel that they can catch fish with just those ten types of flies. All right, Jason, I've never been fly fishing before, so how do I start? Uh, practicing or how do I get to know the equipment? How can I use this? How do I learn to cast? Well, Sheldon, the big thing is that you can practice in your backyard. You okay. don't have to have a pond in your backyard. You don't have to have a stream running through your backyard. You can practice in your backyard. Uh, whenever I was younger, my dad bought me a little kiddie pool, you know, one of those little four foot round pools. He gave me a rod, gave me, uh, you know, put, put a, a lure on there and said, here, you know, practice your casting okay. and try and hit that baby pool. So. Whenever we're learning how to cast a fly, first thing we want to make sure we do is that we have, enough, have a little bit of line out, right? So okay. you don't want that line to come back in towards the reel. You just want to back cast, right? Like you're going to cast, and then go forward. And with this motion, right, you're trying to keep that fly in the air. You can go slow or you can go fast, but you're just trying to keep that fly in the air. And as you're doing so, you just keep pulling out more line, right? And then when you get to about the point where you think you have enough line out, you hit that spot, you wanna hit that spot, you just let your next forward cast down. fall. Okay. Yep. So and then on our back cast, you can basically, you don't have to reel this line in. So that's a little bit different than a bait caster. A bait caster, you know, you have to reel that line in every time. 
With the fly rod, you can just basically pick that fly back up and give it another toss. Okay. So depending on where you want that to go, if you want it out a little bit further, you know, you gotta let a little bit more line out. Or sometimes, you know, I'll just strip a little bit more line back in and then go out. And I'm in a tree. <laughs> I'm not paying attention. So there are numerous types of fish around West Virginia, and there are, in many cases, particular types of lures that you can use to catch a specific fish. So we just show you a few examples here. We just have a, a, a worm on a hook with a cork attached or bobber attached. Also have a little power bait on a hook attached with a swivel and a cork. But you can see various types of fishing lures here, spinners, I'm gonna call these rooster tails. And also as we go down, various types of jigs. And as we go down, some of the flies and uh, hoppers that we'll use for fly fishing. So get to know the fish that you're going after, the fish that you're chasing, what they, what lure works best for those fish and go out and enjoy. Okay. So we've shown you a little bit about a fly rod, which is a different style of fishing, a different type of fishing. Here we have just a, a regular ultralight bait caster. So it's about a five and a half foot rod, uh, about a five pound test line on it. We've attached a rooster tail. So it's got a little treble hook and a little spinner on top. Uh, but the bait caster itself just has a push button on the back. So you press down on that button before you get ready to cast. And as you cast, you release on the button, which allows your line to let loose and, and go out there. Alden is going to demonstrate now how we actually use this. Uh, but just want to give you a little bit of discussion about what type of rod and reel this is. All right. This is probably the most common that we use around while we're fishing. All right, Alden. Show us how to cast that. Great cast, great cast. And now she's gonna reel it in. So depending on what type of lure you're using, you may throw it out and, and retrieve it just as soon as you throw it out, or you may have a hook attached to the end of your line with a, a, a cork or a bobber with some type of bait on it. And so you cast it down and let it sit and that attracts the fish coming in. So we have one that's a little bit more active because you're casting multiple times, throwing that lure out there to try to capture fish, or you're casting a line and hook out there and just letting it sit uh, with a bait on it. Hopefully something will come by and, and, and bite onto it. So just to demonstrate again, we're gonna press and hold the button, pull it back behind us and cast out. And once we throw it forward, we release that button, which releases the line and allows that lure to go out into the pond. We'll let the master young angler come up here and show us how to do that again. He's a much better caster than I am. All right, can you stand back? Great cast, great cast. There you go. Good job. Hey, remember you gotta reel it in. Cause the flies are harder cause you have to try to catch a fish when you reel it. Yep. Okay, so right, him. <laughs> so we're switching over to just getting, putting a, a My, regular single hook on there. Drag, drag, pack, pack, make a sack. <laughs> You're trying to call the dragonflies in, buddy. Dragonflies are good fish food. Big yeah. fish love dragonflies. Big fish love dragonflies. Yep. Oh man, I had trouble getting that. So, there we go. Why don't you try to get one from me then? I will. What color do you want to use? Orange or green? Green. Want to use green? Because that's Ella's favorite color. Oh, that's Ella's favorite color, huh? Okay, Hayden, 
then we're gonna put a bobber back on here. So if we get a bite, we can see it. All right, looks like we got one. Uh-oh, a little one. But we did catch something. Looks like a little, one of our sunfish, a little brim. That hook through the sides, what we'll do is we'll grab that fish like that, pull that hook out just like that. I believe this is a little, watch out, let's not get hooked up, hook ourselves here. Put that hook on the eyelet there and get it out of the way. So we have a little bluegill, bluegill brim. We've captured small, really small. Now, if you're telling fishing stories, this one's gonna grow by the end of the day. This is gonna be a 40 pound brim that I captured here. But Alden it's, that Alden caught, sorry. So Alden has caught a little bluegill brim, small. You know, the blue coloration, we know it's a sunfish because of the shape and coloration, but if you're looking around the gills itself, this gill here, this little black little ear that you'll see here, and it's kind of the bluish coloration, I'll let you know this is a bluegill brim. But a great day for young Alden. All right, so this is a catch and release pond. So we're going to release this one. And it swims away. It's very important to follow all rules and regulations when you're out enjoying our natural resources, when you're out fishing or hunting. There may be some local restrictions or regulations at this particular site where we're fishing today is a catch and release only. And so whatever you catch, you must release back here on site. Uh, but there are also some state regulations and guidelines that we must follow. So uh, pick up one of these state fishing regulations summary. You can pick them up at Walmart or outdoor natural resources store. Uh, get to know the, the regulations for around the state. Different fish have different rules. Uh, different locations have different rules. So it's very important to understand those rules, rules and regulations before you go out and start your fishing adventure. If you're under 15 years of age, you can fish without a license. But if you're over 15 years, uh, 15 and older have to purchase a fishing license. So make sure that you have that on, on hand before you go out and fish. I have mine. I was, was able to buy it online and print it out and I have it with me whenever I go out into the woods. Whether I'm fishing or hunting, I have that on me. So I'm following the rules and regulations. This is These are put in place to not only protect our natural resources, but also to keep you in, uh, keep you in compliance and, and, and keep you out of trouble. No, we got him. Did you get him? Reel him in. Did you get him? Pick him up. Did you get him? Whoa, look at the size of that one. Good job. <laughs> I, um, I... You're going to have to get a good close-up. This close is the same up. fish that I caught. That's the fish that you caught? That's a great fish. Great work. It's a little tiny. Good job, bud. It's you a know? little tiny sunny. Yep, a little tiny sunny. It's a tiny sunny. Can we look at it up close? Hold it up there in your hand. Hold him up close, bud. Let's see. That's how, I, that's how I was at it. That's how I was lifting up my bass that I caught. Think that, was that bass a little bit bigger than that? Yeah. We were enjoying the outdoors and we we're out fishing. We want to be good stewards of the land. Uh, while we're sitting here fishing today, I found that uh, someone has dropped their, their, their bait bucket, basically some trash that's on the ground. And also they've left some line that's now tangled up in, in, in shrubbery around the pond. So other animals can get tangled up in this. It's just, uh, it's just litter that's been left on the ground. So please clean up after yourself. Make sure that you leave the place where you're fishing better than when you found it. Whenever we're fishing, we're enjoying the environment, we're enjoying being outside. And Sheldon was talking a little bit earlier about being environmental stewards. So part of that is protecting our waterways. If we want to enjoy fishing, enjoy the water, if we want our future generations to enjoy the water, it's important that we protect our, uh, our resources, protect our waterways. Uh, there's areas in in the east where we can only eat certain fish in a certain amount because of the pollution in the streams and rivers. So for, for yourself and for, again, for future generations, it's important that you protect your waterways. Uh, <laughs> you gotta love it. We were fairly successful today, caught a couple of fish. Jason, thank you for coming out, teaching us a little bit about fly fishing, the equipment that you're using and, and how to actually cast. Thank you all for joining us, Hayden, Alden, Thank you for being with us and catching the fish today. The two dads couldn't do very good, but uh, we, did, we did what we could. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and, and I encourage you to get out, dust off that fishing pole, get out in your backyard, practice a little bit on your casting, 
and then uh, go out and, and try to catch some fish here in West Virginia. Great time to get out and enjoy our natural resources, our water resources in the state. And next up, we're gonna learn about turtles. Ooh. Hello everyone, I am Sheldon Owen, Extension Wildlife Specialist with the West Virginia University Extension Service, and today I have a little eastern box turtle that I want to in introduce to you. This is one of our 14 species of turtles that can be found here in West Virginia. This turtle is unique because it is completely terrestrial. It spends its entire life on land. Our other turtles are out in the ponds and streams and creeks uh, near and in water. You'll never find an eastern box turtle out basking in the middle of a pond. They're going to be found in our forests of West Virginia. So they prefer uh, deciduous forests, which are deciduous trees, those trees that lose their leaves every year, uh, or mixed deciduous and, and, and conifer uh, forests. They will be found crossing fields and, and maybe backyards, uh, but they spend most of their time in the forest. They are a terrestrial species. So they're found in forests. They are omnivorous. They eat, a, a, which means omnivorous means they eat both plant and animal material. And so they'll be eating on clovers and plantains like you see in front of us, or grasses. They'll also eat fruits, uh, berries, such as a wild strawberry or, or even blackberries. They also are carnivorous to some extent because they'll eat uh, slugs and snails, they're very, you know, turtles are very slow, so they have to go after slow moving prey. So think about a slug or a snail's not able to escape. And you see he's trying to escape as we're walking away. Ooh. The carapace is this top shell. Underneath its belly is called its plastron. So eastern box turtles are unique because of this coloration you see here. And I'm gonna try to pick this up. They're called box turtles. Ooh, oh, he's excited. This is a male eastern box turtle. We can tell that because of the color of its eye. The iris or the, the eye is red. A little bit of a fighter. I guess this is a good point to point out that if you ever try to pick up a turtle, be very careful. You can hold it by its sides. It is a reptile, so it has scaly skin. It also has claws. And be careful, that could scratch or cut you. And also, if you look at the beak, its mouth, if it were to bite or reach around and bite you, you know, that would definitely leave a mark. So be very careful when we pick these things up. Now, we can tell this an eastern box turtle, or, or, or one of the reasons why it gets its name, is because the plastron, the belly shell itself, actually has a hinge. So when I pick it up or some predator were to, to try to feed on it or attack it, it can actually, I'll, I'll try to press on it and see if I can get it to close up. It can enclose completely within its shell and be protected. So this is, this is very hard. Turtles, like this eastern box turtle, are reptiles. Uh, they're cold-blooded, which means their temperature is regulated by their, their environments. Uh, you can tell that they're reptiles because they have scales on their skin and also these claws on the end of their toes. Now they look different from a lizard or a snake because they carry this shell around all the time, but this is actually part of their body and you can see that their backbone is fused into their shell. Maybe you can see the little ridge right there of how it's fused into its shell. Our turtles, again, are reptiles and unlike mammals, which give live birth, our turtles lay eggs. So they're box turtles because of that high dome shell, this hinge here that they can fold up. I think we got a picture of its eye. We can tell that this is a male because one of that red color, the, the red iris or the red eye, and two, if I can get it to focus in here and we look at the, the plastron, the belly shell, it actually curves in or it's concave. The shell, the plastron, the belly shell of a female is flat. And so this one, we can tell because of its concave, because it curves in like that, and because of that red iris, this is a male eastern box turtle. Our eastern box turtles are very long-lived species, um, in some cases living over 100 years. They are active from about April through October every year. Uh, they'll breed during that time. Uh, when they lay nests, uh, they'll lay a single nest every year. Females will lay a single nest every year on average about four or five eggs per nest, and the gender of the hatchlings. And so whether they'll be male or female, boy or girl, is determined by the temperature of the eggs. So if those eggs stay at about 70 to 80 degrees, all the hatchlings will be male. 
if the temperatures go above 82 degrees, all the hatchlings will be female. So temperature actually determines which sex or which gender uh, the hatchlings will be. Our eastern box turtle populations here in West Virginia are actually declining. Uh, a few reasons for that, one is habitat loss. You know, the, the places where they live, we're actually losing or, or damaging, fragmenting some of those places where they live. We have some diseases which have been introduced into the state which are causing death or killing some of these animals. They also have a lot of road mortality or they're killed while they're trying to cross the road. They're very slow moving, cars are traveling very fast, and they can't avoid them or get out of the way. So we have a lot of these that are hit on the road and killed on the road. Uh, they're also, because they're such a, a, a beautiful animal uh, and, and people think that they would make a good pet, we have a lot of, of people that collect these and take them home to try to make them in, in, into pets. And they don't make very good pets. And I always emphasize, hey, these are wild animals and we need to keep them in the wild. I actually found this one while it was crossing the road. And so in that situation, I wanted to make sure that this one was safe. So first, we made sure that it was safe for us to stop. We got out of the car, picked it up. If you ever want to move one and we want to help move it across the road, always move it to the side of the road in the direction of which it was traveling. So if it was crossing to the right, I want to take it across to the right and release it on that side of the road. That way, if I take it back from where it came from, it's just going to try to cross the road at a later, at a later time and could potentially get killed while it was crossing it. So, if you ever see one crossing the road and it's safe to do so, please stop and take it to the road, to the side of the road in which it was traveling. So I'm, I'm so glad we were able to find this individual. Uh, I'm so glad we were able to share it with you. Uh, again, we are concerned about the numbers of Eastern box turtles across West Virginia. So right now, West Virginia Division of Natural Resources is conducting a citizen science project where you, a citizen scientist, can call in and report a sighting or a finding of an Eastern box turtle around the state. Go online to West Virginia Division of Natural Resources webpage, look up their Eastern Box Turtle Project. Uh, there you can fill out information of where you saw it, when you saw it. You can also upload photos that you've taken of it. Um, and so it's a great way that you can be a part of the solution. You can be a part of the conservation efforts for this species. We are both excited you could join us today. We want to encourage you to get out and explore, visit a state park, a national forest, a, a national park. Just get outdoors here in West Virginia and see the natural world, see what you can find out in our wild and wonderful West Virginia. And finally, we round out episode 30 with our Renaissance man, Henry, reading a Terrapin poem. Hi, I'm Henry. And today, I'd like to share with you a poem called The Terrapin by Wendell Berry. The Terrapin and his house are one. Though he may go, he's never gone. He's housed within, from nose to toe, a door, a floor, and no window. There's little room. The light is dim. His furniture is only him. He sits alone, says not aloud. Where no guest comes, a thought, a shout. He pokes along. He has no haste, he has no map, and no suitcase. He has no worries, he has no woes, for where he is, is where he goes. Ponder this wonder under his dome, who, wandering, is always home. Well friends, that's it. This isn't goodbye, but it's see you soon. Thank you again for tuning in to Energy Express, and we hope you have learned as much as we have. It's been great to have you over the past six weeks, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.